Okay, um, hi everyone, good morning. Uh, I'm Tali Dekel, and today I'm going to talk about visualizing and understanding neural networks. Um, so I hope you are all convinced by now that deep learning has been like a huge uh, revolution to the field of computer vision. We reached some major breakthroughs in a number of uh, very important uh, visual tasks like image classic classification, segmentation, object detections, and many more. And our um, models became more complex, more advanced, deeper, uh, with many more parameters. And we're kind of like living in this area where we feel that you know computer vision has finally started to work. But with all this exciting development, we also lost something. And uh, that something is really our ability to interpret our, our algorithm. You know, before deep learning, we used to kind of like write our uh, uh, algorithm line by line, and we knew each line what it is doing. And now we have this huge function so millions of parameters. They are nonlinear. And I'll tell you a secret. Soon you will experience this. You will train a network, and it will unexpectedly uh, fail very disgracefully. And you would stare at it and wonder why it predicts why it predict uh, why it predicts what it predicted. And um, I think we all understand now that in order to build uh, uh, more intelligent models and actually use them in real world real world applications like medical or autonomous driving we must um, uh, design transparent models and we must strive to understand uh, what are these models are doing when they would fail and what they are encoding in these intermediate layers. Um, so that's going to be the topic of the class today. And I'm going to cover lots of different uh, uh, methods. On some, I'm going to go into more details and, and some of them I'm, on, I'm only going to briefly mention. But I try to kind of like keep the slides very self-contained. So you often see some uh, links there that I encourage you all to check out later. OK, so let's deal with it, yes? Um, okay, so we have a classifier. We're going to focus in this class mostly on uh, uh, models that were trained for visual classifications. We have our model, and um, you know, each layer is essentially a filter bank where the kernels of these filters are learned. So one immediate thing that we can do is to visualize those learned kernels. Like in the first uh, uh, layer that operates on RGP, we can just grab those kernels and visualize each one of them as a tiny image. So here is an example. Uh, we, we grabbed like the kernels from the, the first convolutional layer. We have 64 different kernels there. And then um, uh, each kernel is 11 by 11. And because it operates on an RGB image, it, it, it has like three channels. So that's what you see in the dimensions here. And uh, what we can see that uh, actually these filters, what they are learning is kind of like all these oriented edges um, that operates on the image. You can see also some color contrast on those filters. So that means that they look for typical types of color patterns in the images. And uh, what's it, what is really interesting is that if we do the same thing for different models that were trained, different architectures that were trained for classification, we can see that this pattern uh, um, exists in those uh, filters as well. So that kind of like tells us that typically those early layers in the network, they learn these uh, low level uh, image representation or image feature, features like uh, these oriented edges and color patterns. And um, unfortunately, you may think, OK, so let's go deeper and visualize the deeper kernels. Um, but that won't be so meaningful. First of all, you would apply this already on kind of like a filtered representation of the image. And um, remember that we increased the number of channels. And so now we'll have many more kernels to look at that. So unfortunately, this uh, method doesn't really scale up. OK, um, so now another thing kind of like straightforward that we can do, uh, we have this classification model. It has a bunch of convolutional layers and uh, followed by this fully connected layer here. And then we have the output layer. This output layer is just kind of like a linear classifier. We can treat the, the output layer as a linear classifier. And we can treat the neural network up until this layer as kind of like a function that uh, the the job of this uh, function is to give us this uh, an image embedding. 
that if we feed this image embedding into the linear classifier, we will be able to get the correct uh, output, the correct classification score. So uh, one immediate thing that we can do is to look on this uh, image embedding. We can look at this last fully connected layer and wonder and, and kind of like uh, uh, strive to understand what it encodes. It must contain useful information for this very simple linear classifier to give us the correct class and it must be very different from the uh, pixels, the original image pixels. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to take a collection of images, a bunch of images, we're going to feed for them in the network and extract this, uh, uh, this uh, deactivation from this fully connected layer that will give us like a feature vector. Uh, it will be 4K uh, dimensions in this case. And now uh, what we can do, we can, we can take a query image and compute an Euclidean distance, a measurement that measures, you know, how um, this query image is similar to all my all the rest of the images in that in that database. Uh, for example, just using L two on the on this uh, fully connected layer, and then we can retrieve uh, the nearest neighbors, the images that are most similar to this query image, uh, in the sense of kind of like similarity in this feature space. So what you can see here. Uh, so this is the query image and what you can see uh, in each row uh, are the top six nearest neighbors from a large database of images. And now uh, what we can immediately kind of like understand that, you know, these images are very different in terms of like pixel RGB similarity, right? Like, for example, if I take this pumpkin here, uh, it has like this black background here. And on the uh, second column, you can see that, you know, the structure here is very different. These very bright regions uh, are not kind of like, are, are not aligned with the bright regions in this, in this image. And the elephant here, for example, it appears in many different poses. So it, it kind of like gave us this magical image representation that can capture the essence of this image, ignoring pixel you know, similarity, um, and, that's, and, and that's super cool. Um, I have a question. Very useful. Um, okay, so those uh, image embeddings, they live in this very high dimensional space. Um, um, and uh, it's very hard for us to make sense of it, right? Like we, we can visualize things in 2D or 3D, and that's what we want to do. We want to take this high dimensional uh, feature space and reduce it into something we can actually visualize. Um, and, and we can do that using like uh, um, uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms. Unfortunately, I won't have time to go into details about those methods, but just kind of like to give you the very general idea, um, the, the input to those methods is kind of like the set of features of feature vectors that we computed on our database. And now these algorithms will compute like a 2D projection of those features that will try to maintain as much of the structure uh, as we have in the data. And those methods kind of like they differ from one another in the way they uh, kind of like in their projection. So for example, a principal component analysis is a linear method. In this method, the projection is linear. Uh, and TSNI uh, is, is a method where the projection is nonlinear. And they also differ in the way they uh, define what is the structure. How, how do you define the structure in the data? Um, so I just mentioned PCA and TSNI because these are the most, uh, you know, popular and useful. TSNI is widely used in, in deep learning and you should get familiar with, uh, with these two methods. Um, and what you see here, this plot, uh, so again, th these are kind of like MNIST. Uh, th this plot is for MNIST data set. We have a, an MNIST classifier. We feed our images into the MNIST classifier. We extract this uh, last fully connected uh, feature. And now we use TSNI to reduce the dimensionality, in this case, from 1K feature vector to 2D. And then we plot these 2D points where the color encodes kind of like the class of the images. So it's pretty cool that you know, we trained this model for classification. But now, but now we get like a feature space that kind of like clusters the classes, um, um, as you can see here. So each cluster corresponds to a, 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 di a digit. Okay. Do you have any questions, by the way? If not, I'm gonna continue running. I have a question about a previous slide. 
Okay. The one with the nearest. Um, so you said that you're doing this on the image embeddings. So I wonder, is it also possible to do it on the softmax distributions and would it be also beneficial? So in the softmax, it's, you, you, I, I don't think it will uh, be so beneficial because you, if you think about it, like the classifier in the end, like ideally, let's say you have the perfect cl classifier, it will just give like hot, one hot vector to all the elephant images, right? So we will just obtain all the elephant images to be at the same class, the same cluster. Um, uh, but if we go to this kind of like before the soft, uh, softmax layer, it could be that there is more information in those features uh, before we kind of like normalize this using kind of like the linear classifier and the softmax. Okay, uh, so now I want to show you some visualization I actually made a long time ago when I just started with uh, deep learning. So instead of taking, you know, a bunch of images from different classes, here I took uh, a C4 classifier and I only embedded cars, like one class, okay? I took a bunch of images from a, from a specific class. I fed them into the network and then I extracted, in this case, I didn't go up until the fully connected layer. I stopped at the uh, convolutional layer number four. I flattened the uh, spatial dimension and then I used Tisney to embed uh, the, the features into 2D. And what I'm plotting here are the images themselves. So each point here, if two images are close are nearby, it means that they are nearby in con four layer uh, feature after I removed it uh, into 2D. And what we can see here um, uh, that, you know, the cluster, the clusters here are really kind of like, they're matching mostly color information. So we have all the white background cars in one side, we have all the red cars in, in the other side. So it's mostly dominated, dominated by the colors. But what happens if we go into a deeper layer? Uh, so this is the embedding at the same, the same procedure for conv layer number nine. And what you can see here is actually really interesting. Now you can see that you know, we have clusters that correspond to the orientations of these cars. So we have all these kind of like right, right side uh, cars you know, nearby in this embedding space. Although again, in pixel space, they are very, very different from one another. And I remember that, you know, I was super excited by this uh, uh, at that time, because again, like imagine like crafting a, a feature that will encode such things, uh, you know, uh, without, without this uh, magical tool. I included here a link so you can see like a, a different visualization for different uh, uh, classes and um, uh, you can check it out offline. Okay. Um, so these nearest neighbors and these new embeddings, they give us some insights about what these features encode globally about an image. But, we, you know, we may want to ask like a more fine-grained question, which pixel matter for classification? We're given an image, we fit it into the classif uh, class uh, to our classifier, and now we want to know which of the image pixel, which, which regions uh, actually were super important for this decision. So Zeiler and Fergus uh, introduced uh, 2014, this idea of occlusion or occlusion. Uh, and the idea is very simple. You basically place an occluder. This is like this gray patch on the image. This image originally was labeled as Pomeranian. This is a type of uh, species of a dog. And now we want to measure if I block this region in, in my input, how, would this, uh, 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 how is my probability for this label would change, okay? We can do this for all the, the, the gray patches in, 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 in the image, and that will give us a probability map of Pomeranian each time we include a different uh, region in the image. And what you can see here uh, is that if we block the face of the dog, the, actually the probability of Pomeranian drops significantly. Uh, however, if we block like a, you know, a region in the background, it doesn't change the decision of the classifier that much. So that kind of like helps us to see maybe the, the classifier kind of like look at the wrong signal uh, or, um, or maybe it's looking at what we expect it to look. And we can overlay this in, um, kind of like probability map on, on the image so you can see that uh, where exactly it corresponds. And we can also do this uh, not for the final classification, but to also to intermediate feature maps. So for example, we can pick the feature map that has had the strongest activations and we can sum uh, uh, its activation 
in all spatial regions, that gives us like a score, a score for this activation map. And we can do the same trick and get this, this uh, heat map here. Okay. Again? Yes. So I'm saying like, let's say that I've seen that layer five channel number four activated the, the, the strongest uh, for this uh, image. So now I can take uh, layer five activate uh, channel number four. I can average or sum uh, the activation over spatial locations. And that gives me a single number that tells me, you know, uh, what was the activation in that uh, feature map. And I record, I record that number in each pixel here. Okay. And now again, I repeat this for blocking different regions and recording uh, um, uh, that number in that map. Okay. Um, so you can see here some uh, some more examples. So what we can see here that you know in the, the case of car car wheel, uh, you know as we expect, like the probability of car wheel drop significantly when we block this entire region. But in layer five, actually, uh, that was the strongest activation. It actually activates the the text on the car. Okay, and same here. Like you can see that the uh, the dog itself the probability kind of like significantly drop, but layer five actually looks at the face of that uh, woman here. Can you explain maybe uh, what does each pixel means in that? Um, in, in which column? It, it, let's say in the previous slide. Um, yes. I mean, you ran over uh, with, a, with a square over the image and each pixel in the probability of Pomeranian does it correspond to like the center of this box or I, I think I missed? No, no, I, I just, what I do, let's say, okay. Um, what I do is this, this is the input to the classifier, okay? This is the input to the classifier. This is the actual RGB image that I feed into the classifier. And I compute now that I block these regions, right? Now that I have this gray uh, square in that, uh, uh, in that region, what will be the classifier output for Pomeranian? Will it be one like it used to be, like 0.999 uh, uh, probability that this is still Pomeranian, or will it be, will it drop to I don't know 0.4? So if you look at that pixel here, okay, that corresponds to the probability of Pomeranian when I block this region, and you do this for all the different uh, um, grayscale um, um, patches um, when we slide them over the image. Each time you block a region, fit it into the classifier, record the probability of Pomeranian. Okay, so we just pick a pixel on, on the square, say, let's say the center or the edge. Oh, okay, you mean where exactly that pixel is? I think it yeah. was the top left uh, um, okay. corner. Okay, thank you. Okay. And how does the size of this patch depend, uh, actually? Metal. Right, so 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 you can intuitively guess what is patch size. Uh, you know, you need to pick it up. It's a parameter that you need to tune. If it's too tiny, you wouldn't get so meaningful, you know, maps because the network will still have enough information to to kind of like uh, get the correct class. Like if I only block like I don't know a small tiny patch here, it will probably won't change the probability and it won't give us like much information. So I guess it, it's a free parameter that you, ask, that you have to uh, tune, okay? Um, question, when we look at the activation in the layers, is that the average over all the channels or like how, like maybe different channels have like diff different meaning? We, we, didn't, we didn't average over channels. Uh, here it's an, uh, you take like a certain kind of like feature map in some channel and you sum the values to get to like a, you know, a scalar number that will say overall, what was the activation in that channel? Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so now I wanna take, I wanna talk about a very useful method. It is called class activation maps. It also aims to kind of like uh, have this heat map saliency, but it's doing it in a very different way. It's doing it by changing the architecture of, the, uh, of our classifier. So uh, they, they observed that, you know, uh, when we have this classifier, again, it, it kind of like, it has all this bunch of convolutional layers, and then it has this fully connected layer and a linear classifier. 
And what they observe is basically that we lose all the special information. We remove all the special information that we have in the last convolutional layer when we uh, apply this fully connected layer. And we, we kind of like, we lose our localization ability, okay? And what they suggested is to do something else. They want, uh, so, so they take the, the output of the last convolutional layer. So you can see these M and M are uh, the spatial dimensions and we have C features. I colored each channel at a different color. And now what they suggested is basically to uh, apply a global average pool on each of these channels of this feature map, okay? So now uh, the, the channel uh, that corresponds to here to the first channel that is uh, marked by yellow is reduced to a single number, which is just the average of this feature map, okay? So after you do this, um, you basically just apply a linear, uh, a linear uh, layer the, and, uh, to compute the, the class uh, probabilities. And just to give you a bit of intu intuition about why uh, it makes sense, I want to remind you that uh, I think somewhere in class three, Asaf uh, mentioned, uh, you know, this property of uh, feature maps uh, to kind of like uh, launch into some property of our input image and fire on that. So in this example that Asaf gave uh, a while back, you had like a feature map that corresponds to, that activates or fire on faces, right? Um, and, and we can think about each of these channels are kind of like different uh, feature maps that activates different properties in our image. And then we apply this global average pool to reduce it into a single number. We still preserve this uh, property. We still preserve that each one of these average pool uh, numbers are still kind of like matched to, to one uh, distinct kind of like feature in the image. And um, uh, with this modification, now we, uh, uh, we can define the class activation maps, which will be kind of like a linear combination of our feature maps based on these uh, uh, learned weights. Um, so let me parse this for you. Um, again, we did this modification, okay? We, um, we took our, uh, the last convolutional layer, we reduced each feature into a single uh, scalar using global average pool. And then we applied this uh, linear classifier at the end to get like our class. So for example, the Australian Terrier class is, uh, is given to us by W1 times uh, this, uh, uh, this neuron, W2 times this one, W3 times this one, plus W4 times this one, right? Um, and again, with this intuition that each kind of like uh, um, uh, feature map fires on a different region, now we basically go back to these features and we weight them according to these learned weights to get our class activation map for this specific class, for Australian Terrier in this case, okay? Does that kind of like, do you have a question on this? Yes, can you explain uh, again, what is the images? How did you create the images? How did I create the image? Yes, you have the W's is uh, the weights of coming from the averaging of the global channel, right? Okay, so le let me recap, okay? Let me recap quickly. Um, we, ha we have our last convolutional layer and then we take each of the channels here and average them in special dimensions. So the yellow is reduced to this yellow number, the green reduces to this green number and so on. And now I apply a linear uh, layer on these uh, average pool uh, features to give me my final um, uh, output, okay? So for example, this class of Australian Terrier would be given by a linear combination of these kind of like average pool layers. This is how they build this uh, classifier, okay? And now with this modification, what we are doing to create our class of activation map for this specific class is to take an, a linear combination of these original feature maps and the coefficient for the linear uh, uh, um, uh, combination here are coming from the learned weights that produces this specific class. So if I'm looking at Australian Terrier, there are some specific weights that are learned to produce this class. I take those coefficients and now I weight not the average pool layers, but the original channels in my uh, um, last convolution image. And that gives us this output that basically aggregates the activations from different channels and it gives more weights 
uh, you know, to Nurion here that fired Morth in order to give us the, the final plus. And I want to go into a, a formal definition of that, okay? So let's uh, have some notations here. So if we mark FK to be one of those uh, um, feature maps, this one or this one or this or, or that, um, now the average pooled layers are given to us by what? Can someone help me here? Yes, no? Just the average of the spatial locations of this exact Exactly, feature. so these are the K, uh, so, so these are the average pooled uh, features here that we visualized here. They're just given by the uh, uh, average or the sum of the, uh, of the original feature maps. And now our score is just given to us by a linear combination of these average pooled uh, uh, features. And these, are, these weights are learned, okay? And now we can plug in you know, this expression. We get uh, this term here, and now we can switch the order of the summation. And what you can see here, um, that we have a sum over special locations. And here we have a linear combination of our weighted um, uh, feature maps. And can you tell me what this inner sum is? The average of the weights times the, the feature attack position for the features. Yes, and, and exactly this is the, the inner sum is exactly what we defined as the class activation map, okay? It's a linear combination of the original feature maps weighted by the learned weights. And this is exactly what we defined as the class activation maps. And what you can see from this kind of like uh, uh, equation uh, is that, you know, the class activation maps um, directly uh, affects our uh, class core. So the class core for Australian Terrier is actually given to us by a spatial average on the class activation map. Okay. Uh, Tali? Yeah. In terms of, uh, say, classification accuracy, is this like new architecture comparable to the standard ones? Right. So this is an excellent question. So I, I, and this is one of the downsides of, of this uh, technique that it uh, requires an architectural change. But actually in kind of like modern, uh, you know, um, uh, network, in many cases, they are actually doing this modification for different reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons to do this is that you get a fully, connect, a fully convolutional uh, network that doesn't have to work with a specific image resolution, right? Like if we, uh, uh, if we now uh, perform global average pool and produce this, it doesn't matter what is the spatial dimension of these feature maps we collapse them into the single scalar, and now you get like a fully convolutional uh, layer that could work on arbitrary resolution. Um, um, but I, I will talk later about a method that doesn't, that kind of like generalize this and doesn't require architectural changes, okay? Um, so let's see some results. So what you can see here uh, on, on, on the first two rows are examples from uh, Caltech uh, 256 uh, data set. And you can see, you know, um, you know, this image, which images, uh, which regions kind of like uh, are important for uh, the classification results for classifying these images in mushroom. Um, or again, like which image regions are important for, uh, you know, classifying those images as penguins and so on. Um, so this is uh, pretty nice. One small detail that I didn't mention that you can see that if we kind of like visualize the last, uh, the last layer, it's not going to be at the same dimensions of the image, uh, image dimension. So what they do is just like a simple resize to bring it up to the uh, image resolution. So it won't be like very super accurate, but it does give like a, um, a very good discriminative uh, uh, nature of feature maps that tells us uh, uh, what are the important features uh, in the image. Uh, but as you guys mentioned already, uh, CAM or class activation map, they can be applied only on the last layer. And they also requires, uh, you know, global average put and cannot be applied to arbitrary models. Okay. Okay, so, so far we only kind of like utilize a forward passes in our network. Uh, what we didn't leverage 
is basically the fact that you all did homework uh, uh, three and you're all expert in back propagation. And now we can uh, utilize the fact that we can, uh, that our neural renderer is a differentiable and we can also utilize backward passes, okay? And now I want to remind you all that our goal is to reason about which image pixels are important for classification, okay? Um, we can ask this question a bit differently. We can say that, you know, if we change a little bit my, if I'll change a little bit my image pixels, I want to know how would that affect my score, uh, my final score. So for example, here, if I'm gonna take this image of a monkey, if I'm gonna change a bit my pixels, how is that gonna affect my final score of this image to be a monkey, okay? So in other words, uh, what does this imply? Uh, it implies someone can, can tell me what, how can we define this mathematically? <clears throat> what we're looking for here? Changing the input to measure a change in the output. Does it ring a bell? Derivative. Continuous function. Well? Continuous function. It's the gradient with respect to the image. Oh, yes, I heard the word. Can you repeat? It's the gradient with respect to the image uh, pixels. Exactly. What we want to do, we want to take, uh, we want to compute the gradient of this cl class core with respect to the image pixel. Again, think of this neural network as a function, and I will want to measure how a change in my input will affect on, 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 on my output. And this is exactly, you know, the uh, definition of derivative and gradient, and this is what we want to do here. Um, and um, what's really cool is that we can do it very easily just using backward pass in this network using back propagation. Uh, so I'd like to remind you all uh, that you know in class two you learned back propagation and you learned how to compute the gradient of some loss uh, with respect to the network weights. Here we are doing something a bit different. Here we want to um, uh, compute the gradient of some output uh, neuron. In this case, let's say uh, the one that corresponds to uh, the, the monkey class with respect to what? To each of my image pixels and what will be kind of like the mathematical definition of that? Someone help. It will just be kind of like the probability, uh, uh, sorry, the derivative of this neuron with respect to each one of those image pixels, okay? This is what I want to compute. These are my image pixels. This is uh, my output, my target uh, class. And I want to change, if, if I change a little bit my image pixel, how would that affect the output, uh, um, the probability of this uh, uh, image to, to be uh, a monkey, okay? Um, so we're going to briefly talk about that, and then we're going to take a short break. Um, um, Tali? Yeah. So just like intuitively, something that's a bit unsatisfying about this approach, I would say, is that it kind of asks about each pixel separately holding the others fixed. And somehow, you know, when we think about images, at least, I, I don't have intuition that changing a single pixel does anything. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very kind of like healthy intuition because uh, if we're going to visualize how those uh, saliency maps looks like, they indeed looks a bit, um, you know, spiky and noisy and, um, and they are not super uh, discriminative. So that's really kind of like, you know, the downside of this approach, but it does kind of like can give us like an overall sense on, on kind of like what of these, uh, uh, what are the important uh, uh, region in this, in this image. So we can see even here in the dog example, you can kind of like see this uh, dog silhouette coming up from this kind of like uh, um, um, gradient uh, map. And, and just to say another, some details that I didn't mention is that we, uh, you know, you compute this derivative if it's a grayscale image, you can just take the absolute value to visualize this map. If it's an RGB image, then what they did is to take the, maxima, uh, the maximal gradient over RGB. And that's what's being visualized here. Okay. Can you repeat your last sentence about the R RGB? Yes, I'm saying, so if you compute um, uh, this derivative and it's an RGB image, you will have a gradient uh, with respect to each one of the 
you know, R, G, and B channels. And in order to kind of like merge them into a single map, what they did is to take the maximal values in, uh, for each pixel uh, between those uh, gradient values. Um, okay, so just to uh, wrap up here and conclude uh, this part, um, what we've seen, we've seen uh, two different approaches to compute saliency. One is kind of like uh, based on back propagation um, and can be applied to existing methods, uh, to, to existing models, doesn't require any architectural changes. It kind of like highlights these fine grained details, but it's not very discriminative as we've seen in the class activation maps. And uh, this method, on the other hand, can be applied only to the last layer and could be, cannot be applied to arbitrary models. Uh, we're going to take a short break. And when we are back, we're going to talk about, you know, how can we kind of like uh, combine the best from uh, uh, these two worlds and, and pixel-based uh, uh, back propagation and class activation map. And I will also um, talk later uh, about how this entire kind of like uh, line of works give rise to very cool image synthesis and manipulations uh, uh, methods. Um, so let's Three see. Seconds. Okay. Okay, so we, we are back. Um, uh, so just to recap, we talked about the um, how can we use backpropagation to compute the gradients of a, a specific uh, score with respect to the image pixels and get the saliency map. And we also talked about the class activation maps that kind of like requires this architectural change of uh, replacing a fully connected uh, layer by a, an average pool. Um, and now, um, uh, you know, uh, we talked about the pros and cons on, uh, of each one of them. And uh, I want to talk about um, a, a method that kind of like combines the best from both worlds. It's actually kind of like combines the pixel space gradients with uh, the idea of class activation maps. Um, and in order to kind of like, uh, you know, remove the limitations of CAM. So, so uh, gradient weighted class activation map or uh, in short graph CAM, uh, it's a method that could be, that can be applied to arbitrary models and arbitrary layers. Um, um, again, the layers that is mostly in, in, interesting in, in those types of uh, method is the last uh, convolutional layer. So we're gonna focus on that. Um, but um, it basically generalizes uh, the class activation map. So we're gonna talk about it um, and now. Uh, so the idea is as follows. Uh, we're gonna pick um, uh, a feature map. So again, we, let's assume that this feature map is, is uh, taken from the last convolutional layer. And uh, now, again, let's say this image was classified, was classified as Australian Terrier. Now I want to compute the derivative of this uh, output score with respect to some feature map in, in the last convolutional layer. So this is the expression here, right? Like this is the class score for, uh, that uh, corresponds to Australian Terrier. And this is my um, um, feature map. And I want to compute the derivative. I want to uh, uh, compute, I want to know if I change a little bit my feature map in, in that, uh, how it's gonna uh, affect my uh, class score for this image to be classified as Australian period. And <laughs> again, this uh, gradient can be computed using back propagation. And, and now, um, um, so, so in that sense, this is very similar. This is actually like the pixel space gradients that we've seen uh, uh, two minutes ago, only that now we compute the gradients with, not with respect to the image pixel, but with respect to some feature map in some layer, okay? Any questions about that? Okay, so now uh, the next step will be to take the, uh, to apply a global average pool on the gradients, okay? We're gonna take this gradients map and reduce remove uh, the uh, spatial dimensions uh, just by averaging um, uh, these gradients, okay? So you can think of these alpha k's as kind of like, you know, important weights for the feature map k. So it, if my gradients were really high for a specific uh, feature, this alpha uh, k would be high as well, right? Um, and uh, so that's kind of like quantify, this is kind of like very similar to what we've seen in the class activation maps where we kind of like collapse the feature map 
into a single number by averaging uh, uh, the activations. Here we are averaging the gradients and not the activations themselves, okay? And now uh, we're gonna take a linear combinations uh, of the activation based on this alpha K that we just computed. They also kind of like uh, added this value that they said that improved, but we're not gonna uh, um, talk much about this. What is important is to notice that here again, we have a linear combination of the feature maps, only that the weights are now given by this uh, term here, okay? Um, so uh, if we go back to the class activation maps, uh, we've seen this, this expression for the class activation map, remember? And WK were the learned weights. Here WKs are given by taking the global average pool on the gradients with respect to the feature map, okay? And if you guys wonder, um, uh, WK actually is identical to alpha K. There is a proof in the paper. If you would like to see it, it's a very nice uh, kind of like a mathematical derivation there. And this is kind of like shows that, you know, if we, um, the W, the average pool gradients of the score with respect to the uh, feature map, uh, they, so WK, which are the learned uh, weights, I'm sorry, they equals to this expression in the case uh, 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 we replace the last fully connected layers with the global average pool layers. So GRADCAM is a strict generalization of CAM, okay? And um, what's cool about it is now that we can actually uh, apply it to arbitrary layers and, um, and can also apply it to existing state-of-the-art models without altering their architecture. Uh, so what you see here, this is the input image, and now we can compute, uh, you know, we take a VGG model that uh, typically had like a fully connected layer, and it doesn't have this, uh, you know, uh, global average pool layers, and now we can kind of like uh, ask which of the image regions are significant for classifying this image as a cat, and you can see that it fires on the cat, and we can also ask the same question for the dog, and we can also apply this to resonance, okay? Um, and a, another uh, cool thing that we can do that is not kind of like strict to uh, visual classification tasks, we can actually, uh, you know, take um, a captioning model. It's a model that takes an image and produce a caption uh, for an image. So you can see here the caption that was produced is a man sitting uh, at a table with a pizza. And uh, we can ask, use the same technique to kind of like highlight the image regions that are important to produce this output caption. Again, there are some details here about exactly, you know, how you do this, but you can see that it fires on the face and on the pizza too. Uh, any questions on, on that part? Can you uh, maybe repeat or maybe clarify how is it possible that WK is equal to alpha K when it's when WK is learned? So it's, it's obtained from optimization. So equality is like being close enough no, it's not that it's, uh, I'm sorry, when I'm saying WK equals W uh, uh, alpha K, it means that if we uh, actually take a map, do this uh, kind of like um, architectural change that they proposed in CAM and replace the last convolutional layer with the average, uh, replace the last fully connected layer with this uh, uh, global average pool, and we get like the, um, those WKs, Yes, and do this uh, um, uh, linear combination. What you can show that those uh, WKs, um, they are identical to kind of like uh, this expression that is basically saying, you know, take the output uh, class score and compute its gradients with respect to the feature maps. Okay, so this is just kind of like to say that um, this expression of alpha K is valid also in the case of uh, CAM where they did this architectural change and it still holds in that case too, uh, but it, it's not restricted to that, right? Like you can apply it to any model and you can apply it to any layer and, and, and use this expression. Whereas in, the, in CAM, you are kind of like uh, uh, bounded or, or, or you are limited to, uh, you know, the last layer and doing this um, um, 
and doing uh, this analysis on the last layer and doing this uh, global average pooling on that layer, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a mathematical derivation to look there, but it's not to say that they are equal, kind of like in any case there, those learned WKs can be expressed as this expression in the case of, uh, of CAM. Um, Tali? Yeah. Are you familiar with the paper, I think it's called Sanity Checks for Saliency Maps? I don't think so. No. So I think just to kind of, I found it interesting. Someone uh, gave a talk about it at Weizmann, I think two years ago. Basically what they're doing, I think it's some folks from Google. Um, they're doing a bunch of like sensitivity analysis, which is basically kind of taking these methods and seeing what would the saliency map say look mm -hmm. like if you ran it on like a random network. Okay. And and some of their findings are that these actually don't look different if you run it on a random network. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting in the sense that, you know, if what you're trying to do is to explain the specifics of a trained model, mm -hmm. then it's not clear that these methods, like very broadly speaking, are kind of giving you what you want. Okay, so I think that kind of like actually leads us to, you know, the um, <clears throat> Really, I, we can discuss this paper offline and be happy to chat after uh, class, but I think basically what Gal is saying is that maybe we want to, you know, ask a much more general question. Uh, maybe we want to take our model and now ask, you know, um, so far we've seen kind of like method that look on a specific image. You're given an image, now we want to visualize which regions matter. But maybe we want to ask the following question, what kind of input would maximize the activation of a certain neuron, right? Like if we want to visualize, or if we want to kind of like really kind of like not restrict our model to anything, um, uh, what we want to do is to solve for an image I that maximize the following objective. So SJ uh, L of I is just like a notation to mark like a specific neuron that we're looking at. Uh, so we want to maximize this neuron and RI is a natural uh, image prior, some prior that kind of like encourage the output image to look natural. And we have some weights between them given uh, by lambda. Uh, so just to kind of like explain the setup, you, we had this uh, pre-trained kind of like classification network, right? Uh, we keep the network uh, fixed. We, we, we are not changing the weights at all, but now we are not assuming that we know what is the input. The input is actually unknown and we want to solve for it. The, the image values are actually uh, the variables of optimization, okay? And now um, um, uh, we're gonna use gradient descent and backpropagation to reason about like what should be this input. How can, uh, can we minimize this uh, objective function? Um, basically when we, we know the network, but we don't know the image I. And now um, you might think that, you know, if we want to visualize features, then may, we can do this maybe just using the first term here. We want to maximize, let's say, uh, give me the image that maximize uh, the class for, I don't know, bell peppers, right? And um, um, so this is what this um, uh, term would say. And um, uh, it turns out that using only this term alone is not enough. Um, it's not sufficient, you will basically end up with something like this, uh, very kind of like noisy, uh, non-sensible, non-realistic image that has all these high frequency patterns that the network actually, you know, responds to strongly. And, um, and, and, and the network kind of like these patterns seems to be kind of like, you know, the kind of cheating, right? Like the network finds some way to process this high frequency and produce a target score. And this is very much related to adversarial uh, uh, adversarial uh, attacks on deep uh, on on, um, on CNNs, and um, you will have a tutorial on this on, on Thursday. So I'm not going to spend time um, talking about um, uh, this uh, here. Only I want to say that this natural image part is really important because without it, you will end up with this kind of like very non-realistic images. And I'll touch a little bit more about what this natural image part can be. 
but the setup is clear. Are we, uh, are we good? I mean, we have the classification network. We can treat it as just kind of like a function. Uh, this uh, uh, neural, this is S, J of L is just a function that given an image gives us some output in this network. And now we want to solve for that image. What will be the image pixels that will maximize this uh, activation, this neural, okay? Um, Can you say again, what is image natu natural image prior exactly? Yeah, so we will talk yeah. about it a bit more, but this is something that, you know, is made to define that this is not a desired output. And what we want is something more natural, okay? And you can think about it that in the very extreme, when you are asking which type of uh, image will maximize, I don't know, uh, 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 some class, in the end, in the extreme, you have a family of images. You have a bunch of images. All the images in the, in the worlds of dogs will eventually map to some class. So this is a very difficult optimization problem because you have many possible images that will map to the same output. So you need some regularization here, okay? So this is a form of regularization. Um, instead of this like uh, constrained optimization, which might be difficult, can you just try to like within the training set, find the image that maximally activates the neural? You could, you could. I, it's kind of like very similar to what we discussed with the nearest neighbor. But then again, you will get an image you, and you wouldn't know if this image is picked because of the background or because of the foreground, or what is it in that image that kind of like maximally uh, corresponds. But there are methods that are doing, doing that. I haven't covered it here. But the uh, advantage of optimization is that you are really kind of like, you know, you're not limiting the network to look on a specific input. You are, uh, it, the, you can kind of like isolate really kind of like what the network is looking for. And the way we're going to do this is, is we're going to initialize our unknown image in some manner. It could be either zeros, mean test unit, test image, random noise. There are different techniques on how to do this initialization. Uh, we're gonna, and then we're gonna repeat the following stages. We're gonna feed the uh, image into our neural network to compute the uh, target uh, neuron activation, this SJLO5. Uh, and then we're gonna compute in a, forward in a backward pass uh, the uh, gradient of this uh, neuron activation with respect to the image pixels. And then we're gonna update our image. So this is simply kind of like a gradient descent um, 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 step that we use to kind of like, uh, uh, it's actually a gradient ascent because we are maximizing uh, this objective, um, but it's using all the tools that you guys have learned on backpropagation and uh, through a neural network. And again, uh, so just a concrete example, uh, the neuron activation in many cases will be some target class score. So again, like uh, I want to find the image that uh, maximally activate the, uh, the class score for, uh, let's say, a cup and, and uh, a very simple kind of like stupid, uh, in a sense, a regularization or uh, image prior that we can have is just the L2 norm of the generated image. So we want an image that will change very, that will be very kind of like small, in a, in a sense, the values will be small. And if you do that, um, these are the types of images that you can get uh, for different, uh, for different target class classes. So these, these are, this is the type of image that you will get if you do this procedure for dumbbell or a cup or a Dalmatian. And you can see that even though this is an extremely difficult optimization problem, and uh, it's a many to one uh, um, uh, mapping as we said and so on, you could still see some structures here and some textures here. So you can see some kind of a dumbbell shapes here or cup shapes here. And you can see Dalmatian textures here and some maybe uh, you know, ears here. So it's doing something. Um, and then you know, people realize uh, that uh, actually you know, working on this image prior is very important. Um, so um, again, I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but this is uh, uh, the results that you can get for dumbbell with a, a fancier uh, natural image prior. And what you can see here, uh, what are these? Can you guess? Arms. Exactly. So you can see that the network kind of like um, associate the dumbbell with, uh, I don't know, some 
very kind of like uh, strong arms. <laughs> and, and maybe, you know, there is bias in our database. Maybe, you know, we have too many, we, we don't have enough images of dumbbells alone. And, and most of them kind of like contains uh, uh, people holding them. So that's why the network uh, associate them uh, in, in those images. And uh, it can teach us something about kind of like uh, um, database bias here, okay? And I want to uh, just to give you like the broad spectrum of natural image prior. So again, with no regularization, you, would that, uh, you will get that, uh, this type of input. On the other side of this, the spectrum, we have learned priors that are generative image models. These are, and you will have a class just for talking about like, you know, GANs and, and, and generative uh, uh, image models. Uh, but here you can see that the quality is much, much higher. And in the middle, you have all sorts of methods that kind of like do somewhat hacky, hacky stuff to, to get better images. And I want to refer you to this distilled publication. It's a, an amazing publication on the, not only on the learned priors, but on this entire topic of feature visualization. Um, and just kind of like to give you the idea of what I mean by learn priors. So now, uh, uh, very kind of like in a high level. So before we had only kind of like the input uh, that goes into the classification network. And now when I'm talking about learn priors, we want to bring in the loop like a deep generator network. It could be GANs or it could be any other uh, kind of like generative model. It takes this generative model takes in some latent feature or some some input yes and it and it was trained on many natural images to produce natural images okay so the network itself kind of like acts as a prior of what natural images look like and now we can plug so instead of like just optimizing the input here we can optimize the input here and now we are saying i want to know what is uh, you know uh, what will be the input to my generator such that the image that it will produce will maximize a given score. So the, actually the, the, the prior itself is given by a different network that is also kept fixed and it, it was trained on uh, many examples and it has priors on what and what uh, this, uh, um, you know, the, the manifold of natural images looks like. And you can see some examples below here. And I would say that, you know, someone can, maybe guess what, what is the downside of this approach? You're only exploring this latent space of the gun. If the gun is pretty bad, then like there are certain images that you just can't generate, visualize. Okay, that, that's, that's one limitation. It is true that if there, you know, if, uh, if we have some biases in our deep generator, they will also translate into the type of images that we can generate and not only that, Again, our deep generator could also have some, you know, correlations built into it. Maybe it always generates like uh, uh, the beach with a surfer, or maybe it always generates like trees with some, I don't know, some component, some other components of that. So we kind of like lost a bit our isolation ability when we are kind of like introducing these very high-end uh, deep uh, learned priors. Uh, but we can get very cool images. Um, and, um, okay, so these, these ideas question? and tools, yes, question? Regarding the previous slide, um, yes. not sure I understand, the output of this deep generator is the RI, is the natural image pile? Is the output the of this deep generator network is, is an image. It produces an image. This image go into the classi classification network and gets a score. And now I'm saying I want uh, I want to have the best image, like the image that will maximize a certain score. But now instead of like directly optimizing for this uh, the the input to the classification network, I want to go through this deep generator network because this deep generator network is bounded to only kind of like you know generate natural images. So now I want to say instead of directly you know, optimizing for I am going to optimize for the input to this deep generator that will produce an RGB image that if I plug it into the classifier, I will maximize my score. Okay, but what is RI in this case? What is the natural image prior? The natural image prior is just given by this deep generator network. You don't have it anymore. It's just like implicitly given to you by this network, by the fact that you are kind of like now have this in the loop. Okay. 
Not uh, the, gun, the gun input is the same uh, input, the same data sets the, the classifier was trained on, or a different data set? You need the generator to be able to generate like the same kind of like semantic images, right? Like you, you can't take a generator that was trained to uh, produce to generate dogs and then apply it to kind of like give you an image that no, will maximize I mean, the score of a cup, right? This is the same uh, specific uh, data set because maybe it, the different uh, statistics, uh, like maybe it's not that different from taking the, the, the maximum um, the arg mean from the data set if you generate based on the same no but, but your your objective function is only on the classifier this is fixed it was trained to generate many different natural images and the weights of this is fixed but your um, uh, objective function is only looking at the activation of this classification network it doesn't look for the activation of the deep generator the deep generator is is task here in the optimization is to produce an output that will make the classification score fire at some target class, right? The objective function is defined only on the classification network. Okay. Okay, um, so these uh, ideas of kind of like synthesizing an image that makes some neuron fire gave rise to this idea of feature inversion. So here, the setup is a bit different. We have some input image again, um, um, let's say this image. Yes, and we fit it into the network and we extract um, its activation from some layer. So uh, the activation here is denoted by phi and it has like spatial dimension uh, H by W and it has C channels. And now the task is, okay, I want to generate a new natural image that matches the target feature. I want to find a new image X star that if I'll feed that image into the network, I will get exactly the same features in that layer, okay? Um, so this is the idea of kind of like feature inversion. And you can formulate this given this object, objective functions. Uh, we want to basically have um, 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 an image X star that will basically uh, um, match a target, uh, um, a target uh, feature at some layer. Um, and we still have this natural image prior here. Because um, again, it could be a many to one problem. Uh, at the very end, if this feature is taken from a very deep layer, uh, it will be a very difficult inversion problem because you could have many images that might correspond to that uh, feature. <laughs> so here they used uh, a total variation regularizer. Um, which basically penalizes the gradient of the output image. So this term here, you can see, this is a very simple kind of like um, um, expression for uh, the image gradient in the horizontal direction. Um, and this is um, uh, the image derivative in the um, vertical direction. And we just want to have an image that will have uh, small uh, gradients, okay? So it will, be, uh, it will encourage uh, special smoothness overall. And now, uh, if we run this uh, um, optimization um, and using different, uh, different target features each time, this is the result you get. So this is the original, original images here. And now this is the result if I'm trying to invert uh, ReLU to two uh, uh, feature maps. And, um, and you can see that it, it actually it's very, very similar to the original uh, image. So ReLU 2.2, you still kind of like preserves much of the color and structure information that we have in the original image. But as we go deeper and deeper, it becomes much uh, less uh, uh, similar. So we lose color information. You see that we, we kind of like still have the structure information here in those deeper layers. And, as we go deeper and deeper, we also lose some of the structure, but you know, you, you may be still able to recognize those objects. Like it still looks like an elephant, still looks like an apple and a banana. Um, so, um, so that again, kind of like provides more intuition and more insights about what those different features are encoding. And sorry, Rafael, you had a question? Yes, I just wanted to ask, what does it give us? So. Uh, exactly. So what does it give us? Uh, so first of all, it gives us, again, a bit more intuition 
about um, you know what the what we you know after you reach that point in the class maybe you already kind of like uh, uh, know um, and now um, you know again the early features kind of like preserved colors and deeper layers kind of like preserves uh, more uh, structural or uh, semantic information sorry and in between we kind of like uh, gradually lose the information and we have this hierarchical representation given to us by the features in that uh, network at different layers. And <clears throat> what can we do with this? Uh, so it turns out that we can do this some really cool, um, uh, you know, um, uh, synthesis and editing. Uh, we can use this for synthesis and editing applications. Uh, these two, uh, I'm gonna talk about two methods. They are very kind of like, you know, the most, um, I, I think, I don't know, I was amazed uh, at that time when I saw those results. It was really kind of like shocking. Um, um, there are, I, I want to say that there are like, you know, many other methods that use deep features embedded in kind of like uh, uh, those uh, VGG classifiers, for example, to do image and manipulation tasks. It could be a class by its own. So we are not gonna have time to cover uh, the most. I'm gonna focus on do seminar two seminal works that are connected by the same kind of like authors. So the first method is targeting texture synthesis. You are giving uh, an example image of some texture and now you want to synthesize a new, a new texture image. So this new texture image will have like very different maybe pixel, if you compute the pixel differences between these two images, uh, it will be very different because you have like all these rocks in different configurations but you can see that it has the same, the same kind of like uh, patterns and the same structures as the original one. And, and, um, and kind of like following on this work, um, uh, we're gonna talk about style transfer. Uh, so how can you take you know, a content image, you want to preserve the content and the structures in that image, and you are given an artistic style image, and now you want to synthesize an image that will have the content from image A and the style of image B. Okay, um, so <laughs> let's go into uh, the details here. So again, the setup is we have a texture image and we have a pre-trained CNN, that's our input. And our goal is to synthesize a new image that will have the same texture as the original one. And the way we're gonna do this is again, using optimization. So I'm looking for an image WI uh, that will maximize uh, some loss, okay? So this loss is given by sum of L. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take our original image, fit it into this uh, pre-trained uh, CNN, extract some features, compute some, some representation of texture from those features. And now we basically wanna create a new image that will have the same match a representation of texture. So we're gonna initialize our uh, output image with some random noise. And uh, again, we're gonna fit this uh, into our pre-trained uh, CNN to compute the activations. We're gonna compute this representation of texture and we're gonna have a loss on, uh, that depends on, um, on the features at di uh, different layers. And we're gonna use uh, gradient uh, descent to compute, uh, to minimize this loss and update our image. And the key thing here, so everything I just said is very similar to what we've seen so far. The, the, the key thing here is, you know, what is this loss, okay? What is this loss that captures texture similarity, okay? And uh, again, just to parse uh, this equation again, the sum is over layers, like I select a number of layers and uh, from each of these layers, I define some uh, um, representation of texture. And then I have some laws that kind of like penalize uh, this representation between the output image and the original image. And we kind of like, in the end, my total loss is a weighted sum of these kind of like pair layer um, uh, losses. Okay, questions? Okay, moving forward. Is that our question? I just, we started to talk uh, by trying to understand why we get the output from a network, right? What does it focus in? But now mm -hmm. we're actually trying to generate new pictures. Right. So we, we switched the objective? We switched it uh, even like a while back when we said like, you know, 
let's generate an image that will maximize a certain score, right? Like we already kind of like switched to this image synthesis uh, world uh, when we wanted to throw away our input image and just say, you know, give me an image that will maximize uh, um, a certain score. And I think these um, um, uh, texture uh, uh, synthesis and, 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 and style transfer, they are not exactly related to, uh, you know, trying to understand uh, um, uh, CNNs. They are more kind of like fun, artistic or uh, image synthesis methods, but they grew out of this concept of kind of like trying to solve for an image that will maximize some or will match some uh, um, uh, feature representation that is given by pre-trained uh, network, okay? Um, and I, I want to mention this seminal work uh, by uh, Fortilia and Simicelli. Uh, I hope uh, that you will all find the time to go into this uh, uh, paper. Um, um, this is from 2000 or even the original was two years before. And uh, the motivation or this inspiration for how to design this textual similarity comes from this uh, seminal work. So back then, of course, they didn't have uh, deep networks uh, as we do, and uh, they applied like handcrafted filters on images, but very much kind of like inspirational work uh, that uh, led to this, uh, to our modern neural uh, transfer algorithms. Uh, so this is the idea. Um, <laughs> each layer uh, kind of like gives us a feature map. So again, H by W by C are uh, spatial dimensions. And now what we're gonna do, we're gonna take this and collapse, uh, kind of like flatten the spatial dimension and arrange those features in this 2D C by N matrix and N here equals H time W. So each row here corresponds to a feature map, a flattened feature map in our original uh, on our original uh, output, okay? And now um, the idea is, um, um, is to compute um, what is called a gray matrix. And a gray matrix uh, measures the correlations between any two pairs of features. So the element ij in this gray matrix, uh, which is c by c, is given by fi times fj transpose. And it is basically measuring the correlations between Fi and Fj. Uh, so, so this matrix kind of like encodes, encodes, you know, which features activate together, which features are not activating together. And it's doing it in kind of like a, to all channels um, uh, and across kind of like the channels uh, in, in our original feature map. So you can see that we kind of like abandoned the spatial dimensions, which is, makes sense because we want to capture texture and we are looking at correlations between features, um, uh, feature maps in, in this layer, okay? So we want, we, we, we encode which features tend to activate together, which are not, and which are kind of like correlated with each other. And that's our, uh, basically our representation for a texture in a given layer. Um, <clears throat> and now our loss, this EL that we define is just kind of like we gonna take the original image and, and compute this matrix, uh, gray matrix for some layer. And we're gonna take our output image and now we want to have an output image that will have the same gray matrix as the original one. So this is the term here up to some normalization. Um, so just to recap uh, the algorithm, uh, we uh, again initialize the output with some random noise. We feed uh, the original image to get activations. We compute the original gray matrices for different layers. And then uh, the optimization uh, framework goes as follows. We feed our output image, we get the activation, we compute the gray matrices for different layers, and we apply uh, the following loss. I'm sorry, the WL here are missing. Um, and we use um, gradient descent and back propagation to compute uh, the gradients of the loss with respect to the output pixels. And then we used uh, the result to update our image and we repeat this. Okay. Right. Yep. Can you explain again, why is it okay to lose uh, spatial information when we are trying to produce new texture yes. images? Yes, so let's look at the results and you will understand why. When you are, um, um, so texture is, you know, is a stochastic, uh, um, is a stationary process. Like if you, uh, look at uh, every patch here, 
you want to look in the distribution of those uh, structures, but you basically want to come up with an image that will have a new, a new com uh, composition of those elements, right? So if you were to apply some loss that will match uh, some structure, you will lose that. That's why we are uh, looking at second order statistics and not like uh, first order statistics of the image. Um, and, and what I'm showing here, are, here you can see original image and uh, here you can see kind of like the, um, the outputs when you are looking at gray matrices at different uh, layers. And what you can see that the structure sizes increases as we go into the deeper layer. So it makes sense again that, you know, the early layers, uh, they have this very small receptacle, they look on oriented edges and things like that. And, and um, you will get like this type of images if you uh, uh, solve this optimization with respect to early features. And as we go deeper, we get like more semantic and more meaningful uh, uh, structures and, and overall uh, better looking images. Okay, so with this idea, um, um, so I want to talk uh, uh, in the time that I have left on uh, neural style transfer. How much more time do I have, by the way? 20 minutes. What? 20 minutes. Ah, okay, so we're good. Um, so style, neural style transfer was really the idea of combining this texture synthesis method with this idea of feature inversion. Um, apologize for the typo. I'm just discovering small things as we go. Um, so you are given a content image and you are given a style image. And um, now we, we've seen that, you know, when we are doing feature inversions, we are kind of like, we are able to reconstruct our original image quite well. So why not, you know, let's define the content of the image based on kind of like feature matching uh, or a, we, we want to have an image that will have the same deep features at some layers. But on the other hand, we've seen that with the gray matrices, we are able to capture a style. So now let's have a style loss that will come from this uh, style image, okay? So the loss is overall a combination of these two methods. We want to, if this image, the content image is A and the style image is B, we want to define a feature inversion loss uh, of the output image Y with respect to the content image A. And we want to have a style loss based on the gray matrices and the texture synthesis work that they've showed you um, uh, between B and uh, Y. So the style image and the output image Y. And that gives like really beautiful or artistic results as you can see here. You, you minimize this the same way we've done in the texture uh, synthesis and the feature inversion. Uh, scheme <clears throat> and alpha here is a parameter that allows you uh, to control the relative weights between the content and style. Okay, so um, just to show an example, uh, you have uh, Picasso here and Brad Pitt. I've taken this slide from uh, Justin Johnson uh, uh, GitHub. Uh, he played a lot with this type of things, and you can see that you know if you have a really high kind of like content loss, you will get this image. Um, uh, which looks much more like Brad Pitt than this Picasso looking Brad Pitt on, on the right hand side. So you can control this to the, the, the amount of style and content using this alpha here. Um, and I think I want to talk briefly about this uh, idea of optimization. One of the downsides of uh, you know, this optimization procedure is that it's super slow. It takes a lot of gradient descent steps to, um, you know, a, a lot of back propagation steps and gradient descent steps to get to the final output. And it's quite slow. Um, so, you know, everyone were shocked by these results at that time and nobody cared, but really quickly, uh, you know, people started to think of how to make this uh, uh, efficient. And now, by the way, you can run style transfer demos on your browser. It's almost kind of like it's super fast and efficient. Um, and I think it shows kind of like, you know, how fast our field is evolving and, and moving forward. And, um, uh, and the idea, um, you know, the principal idea of kind of like to make this uh, uh, more efficient is, is quite simple. Uh, you know, um, let's train a feed forward network um, 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 for each style and use the same kind of like losses that we use during training. So let's say I have the Picasso image, 
I'm going to have a Picasso style transfer network. Uh, and this image, uh, this network is going to be fit for it. I'm going to pass in my input image. I'm going to pass in uh, the content image, really, because this uh, network is going to be kind of like style specific. And now, uh, during training, I'm going to train this uh, using uh, the same losses that we've seen uh, um, in the neural uh, 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 style transfer work. So again, I'm not going to dive into the details here. I just wanted to give you this uh, general idea of, you know, you have a, a very slow optimization based algorithm. You know, you can use the same losses and you, you can use the same techniques to then train a feed forward network to perform this task. So now we are able to kind of like, and of course there were many, many follow-up works on this. Uh, now you could have, you know, networks of multiple styles. And as I mentioned, you can run everything in your browser and uh, everything is super efficient. Uh, but this is a very useful concept uh, to keep in mind. <clears throat> um, so lastly, I want to show you something fun. Going back again, it's uh, um, um, to, this idea of kind of like, uh, you know, understanding deep networks and, and using uh, um, back propagation and so on to uh, solve some optimization problem. So here uh, I wanna uh, talk about deep dream. And the idea there was to exaggerate features. Uh, so given an image, um, you know, it has some activation, some activations are stronger than the others. So now let's modify our input such that those activations that fire would fire more, okay? Um, so you, you take an image, you pick some you know, desired layers in your network, and then you basically want to um, maximize, maximize the activations uh, um, um, magnitude in some uh, given layers, okay? And you do this also using the same techniques that we've seen using gradient uh, ascent here, because you are maximizing and using back propagation. And you repeat this over and over this kind of like you feed, you feed an, uh, the, in, the image, you compute the, the feature responses, and now <laughs> you apply gradient descent to maximize these objectives and update the image and you repeat this. Um, so uh, here you have some really kind of like, uh, um, cool stuff uh, going on. So uh, this is the original image. The original image was uh, an image of clouds. And this is the result of uh, if you apply this optimization procedure that I mentioned on early layers. So now you can see that you we boosted significantly all these curvy edges and maybe kind of like cloudy patterns, uh, edge low level patterns that we had in the original image. And, um, and this is how it looks like. And if you go deeper and you run this to deeper layers and you try to boost activations at more semantic layers, you start, you're starting to create all these like objects and, and structures within this cloud image. So it's kind of like you make this, uh, you know, uh, neural network dream of what it saw in those clouds. And suddenly you have all these like weird kind of like uh, combinations of uh, objects and made up objects that are um, popping up of the, uh, from this uh, image. And eventually, you know, if you train this, uh, if you run this optimization long and long enough, you would lose content. Uh, you would lose the content of the original image and you start getting things like that. Um, these are really kind of like psychodical images that, you know, you can find many of them online. And um, um, these are very kind of like hypnotizing to look at. Um, but this is just another fun thing that uh, I wanted to show you that you can uh, get with this, the same tools that you all kind of like learned about today. Um, so next, uh, next class, I guess, um, you, you, next tutorial, you're going to talk about adversarial examples, and Niv Chaim will talk about that. And this is also very much related to, uh, you know, this optimization uh, framework that we've seen uh, today. And next class, next Monday, uh, Shai will talk about sequences, RNN, and tension. Thank you. And I think I could take a few more questions if, if you have any.